This is your beautiful daughter on the cover of a re-released book. That's right, Unleashed. Unleashed. Um, I have to tell you, first of all, that I had this book with me on the plane coming here mm. to Breakforth in Edmonton. The woman on my left was unleashed from Toronto, coming out to Edmonton with no job. Single woman looking for a new experience. Mm. The woman on my right, uh, we recognized each other, was embarking on a new chapter of her life as a single mother, mm. um, actually heading out to Trinity Western University. And she borrowed this book. And even when we landed, she said, oh, I'm just about finished. Can, can I read it while we're taxiing <laughs> to the gate? She said, this was such a confirmation for mm. her. It, it's as if I had frames around me of, of individuals who needed the permission to release the untamed faith within. Mm. They were both walking that courageous journey. And when you first came to us at mm -hmm. Crossroads and talked about this book, the word barbarian just stuck with me. I thought, barbarian? Why is this man encouraging us to follow the barbarian way? I mean, the only positive word in the dictionary under barbarian <laughs> is natural. <laughs> Everything else is like Neanderthal, is un, you know, untamed, uncouth. It all ties into what you're encouraging here. Yeah, you know, when I first wrote the book, it was originally called The Barbarian Way, and its longer title was The Barbarian Way Out of Civilization. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they had the shortener for the cover. And, and, and it really came out of this frustration on my part that uh, it seemed like the dominant um, influence of the church in America was to civilize people, to make us civil, to... Uh, make us good civilians, make us, you know, to, to good citizens, to really focus on the do's and don'ts of being proper and what you're supposed to and not supposed to do. And, and, and I kept looking back at the scriptures and going, well, John the Baptist wasn't very civilized. You know, he wore, you know, camel skin and ate locusts and wandered in the desert. And uh, he, he seemed sort of barbaric to me. And I thought it's kind of interesting. God chose this barbarian to prepare the way for Jesus. And, um, and then, of course, you know, John and Jesus were almost like contrasts in some ways because in, in some places, John was very much a guy who towed the line. But Jesus was considered barbaric because he partied. You know, he turned the water into wine. His disciples, you know, drank and, and uh, didn't spend massive amount of time fasting and praying. And, and so he was accused of being, you know, uh, uncivilized as well. And, um, and I just started looking back to the scriptures and realizing that, uh, civilization was being highly overrated in terms of our own faith. That really faith does something profound in us. It, uh, there is a, a touch of insanity that, that happens when you connect to God and you do live a, a more courageous life. You do live a more sacrificial life. You, um, you, you do have a greater confidence in this inner voice that prompts you to take uh, insane at time um, steps and and make choices that really go counterintuitive and and so the barbarian way for me was a way of trying to strip down all the excess of religion and say it's really about this intimate life-changing transformative uh, relationship with the creator of the universe the reason i changed the title and i wrote a new opening chapter is because when i called it the barbarian way what i didn't know what happened is that it became like a guy book you know, a man's book. Cause, because of that rough of the title. title. Yeah, The Barbarian Way. So it's obviously for How men. How many women want to be barbarians, yeah, basically? And, uh, I, I think more, more women than men, but the title, I think, was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I want to come back out with uh, the book with a new title that really was written for women. Um, I wrote the book and dedicated it originally to my daughter, Mariah, because she was really my, my metaphor for my little barbarian. You've got to tell the story yeah. that begins the book. Oh, this is your daughter here. Oh, right. it, it is. You know, Mariah's 19. We were sitting in a restaurant. She might have been 10 years old then. And, and she said, you know, Daddy, you know, when, um, when I grow up, I want to, you know, make millions of dollars and I want to give it all away. And that's so beautiful, you know. But she's a child and, and I want to kind of help her develop some wisdom. So I said, that's beautiful, honey, but um, you don't want to give it all away. You want to take some and reinvest it and make sure you take care of yourself and uh, make some more and then give that away. She goes, I, I don't care about myself. I just want to make millions of dollars, and I just want to give it all away. I want to, uh, you know, I want to give, build homes for the homeless and take food to the poor. I just want to give it all away. And I, and I, and I said, Mariah, that's wonderful, but you can't give it all away because then you're not socially responsible. Because if you give it all away, then someone's going to have to take care of you, which, by yeah. which would be me. That would be dad. And, yeah, and, and so I'm trying to you know, convince her that 
it's not really good thinking. And she got really angry. And she goes, you're not listening. I want to give it all away. I don't care about me. I care about the world. And, uh, and I tried to use a metaphor. It didn't work. And then finally, I realized what I was trying to do is I was trying to really domesticate Mariah. I was trying to put in her a narrative that you need to take care of yourself, make sure you're okay. And rather than really just nurturing and unleashing this passionate love to serve the world and to care for humanity and to really leave her life to God. And, and I thought, you know, I, I, I don't mind being a barbarian myself, but I wasn't as comfortable at that point realizing my little girl was going to live a crazy life. And so when she went to Zambia on a mission trip with her mom and, and was swinging over, you know, the waterfalls in Tanzania and uh, sending me photographs of her insanity and working there with the poor and then crime-ridden communities and then going into Bangladesh to work with, uh, with young girls in the sex trade um, and doing it without me uh, was making me pretty nervous. But I realized that basically she was living out what we wrote and taught and hopefully also modeled for her. And where's that taken her today? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's been a crazy journey for her. She's 19 years old. Uh, she it just put out her first album about uh, a month ago. One and of her songs was in the uh, season finale of that's right. Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy played one of her songs for four minutes and 11 seconds during the epic season finale scene where everybody dies and there's all this sorrow and sadness. And um, New York Times just did a huge uh, piece on her, you know, full color photograph, giving a beautiful critique to her album. Um, she just signed with uh, Paradigm, one of the largest representation agents, you know, for musicians signs bands like Coldplay and others, and, and, and she's one of the kindest, most gentle, most gracious, joyful, loving, caring, serving people I've ever known. And, and I can genuinely say that whatever good comes to her, she is a person um, who um, is worthy of it because of the heart she has and the spirit she has. So I'm really proud of her. And your handsome son, 23, <laughs> single, Aaron, yeah, uh, is here kid. with you. He is with you producing films, documentaries? He, he works with me uh, full time. He was with Mariah and he writes a lot of the songs with her and so they kind of co-write a lot of music together because she does write all of her music and everything. And and uh, he had a band before that and so in many ways he was her musical mentor into the, the musical world and I had some smart small part of that. Uh, and uh, he went to Pepperdine and then he came to work for me. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but we, we started a fashion company a couple of years ago and um, we started making bags at a, first at a, at a repurposed World War II material. And this is, this is actually one of our bags right here. And, um, and it's, all, it's all handmade in Los Angeles. And, um, Those are your been, jeans as well, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, these are our blue jeans. We've uh, come out with some jackets and <laughs> jeans and different uh, men's apparel. Uh, we have a whole line of uh, two collections. One, this is called the Aviator line, or they called the Tribute line. Um, we only do men's stuff. We, we don't do any like women's clothes or women's shoes or bags. And I'm Why just, stop now? You're doing so well with everything. Well, a part of it is I, had a, I have a personal passion to reclaim masculinity. Okay, we can and use that. So there, there's a drive inside of me there. I, 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 having a son and never having known my father and uh, living in Los Angeles and seeing uh, it, almost an essentially fatherless culture, and realizing that even among young men who are trying to find a model, they tend to not want to become like their fathers, but they're looking back even to their grandfathers because they're having to go back two generations to find someone they want to emulate. That was and, the greatest generation, and, wasn't it? Yeah, and I felt like the world of fashion, uh, I think sometimes Christians underestimate the power of fashion. I mean, the first fashion moment in history was when Adam and Eve sinned against God, were naked and ashamed, and God killed an animal and covered them with skin. Man, uh, in that unique way, God was the first fashion designer. Yeah. And it reminded me that fashion does several things. Sometimes it covers our shame. It, it covers who we are. It, it allows us to pretend we're someone else. And, but sometimes uh, fashion is really an extension of who we are. It's an expression of the person we are. And other times, fashion is an extension of our ideals. It, it, it communicates a little bit about who we want to be. And so one of our core statements is that heroism is a style because I started looking across history and realizing there were men and women who lived heroic lives and by virtue of their lives, the way they dressed actually became fashionable. Mm, and so true. young men started dressing like those men because they wanted to become like them. And since it was easier to wear their jacket or their shirt than it was to take on their character, 
they actually started dressing like them and then started acting like them. Our little children do it with the superhero. That's right. That's exactly right. Now I say, look, clothes is like your Superman costume, you know. And, and so I felt like if I could create a narrative in bags and in clothes that uh, called us to live our most heroic lives, to call us to life of nobility, to integrate beauty and, and story, and, uh, and to really create a narrative for reclaiming masculinity and saying that there's honor and strength and also tenderness in being a man, um, for me, that's, that has really high value. I know it's strange for people when they say, you know, when they find out I'm in the fashion industry. And, and I also work in film. And again, it's the power of story. I, I had to ask myself this question. I mean, I speak at Mosaic every week and I teach the scriptures, but I'm dominantly talking to Christians. And, um, and then, you know, we have a podcast that you know, maybe 100, 200,000 people listen to every week. And, but still, there's 7 billion people on the planet. And if, if I were to be really honest, my influence and effect for good is so small in comparison to the influence of Spielberg or Tarantino. Um, and uh, I'm surprised you're able to show up every Sunday <laughs> and, with everything you're doing. Well, I, I felt like if I really felt like um, story changes the world and whoever tells the best story wins um, the culture, then I needed to take the risk and move out of simply speaking on Sunday and writing books that are dominantly read by followers of Christ to telling stories and creating films that brought the broader audience into the narrative of life. And years ago, I was at the Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I watched the premiere of Braveheart before I ever became famous. Mm -hmm. And I sat there, and my heart was pounding against my chest. And, and, and all of a sudden, it hit me. I can't let this be my most meaningful moment. I can't let this be the most exciting moment of my life. Because I was watching this movie that transfixed me and exhilarated me, and I thought, this is the tragedy of life. More and more people are living more exciting moments sitting in a chair in a safe room than they're actually living in real life itself. And, and I felt if I could be a part of telling stories and, and creating art and making films that inspired people to live a more noble and honorable life, then I think I can actually make a greater difference in the world. Wow. Easy to see why the term pastor is never attached to you, Erwin, because you are, you're something else. You know, I, I respect and honor pastors. I think the term pastor is a beautiful, beautiful title. And um, it just never fit me really, really well. And, um, you know, I became a follower of Christ, and I was told, go to seminary. I didn't know what to do, so I went to seminary. I spent 10 years working with Urban Poor because I thought, I don't know what to do with my life, so I might as well help people who need more help than me and, and serve them. And, um, and in that process, I feel like God really um, taught me so much about the values of life and the value of humanity and to care for people who don't have the opportunities I have. And, uh, and then I moved to Los Angeles mostly because I felt like LA was the epicenter of the future. That, that um, art and entertainment were really the narrative of the 21st century. And I didn't know how I was going to affect that, but I knew I, I needed to. Mosaic was almost in some ways an accidental uh, expression of my need for community and my longing to bring my friends into a place where they belonged. And so I, I never have seen myself as a, like a church planter or a guy who was called to do this particular thing. That's why I've never gone to another church. That's why when other churches have called me to see if I would be their pastor, I know there's no question. I, I would never go pastor another church because I don't feel called to be a pastor. I feel called to Los Angeles. I feel called to Mosaic. I feel called to take art and using it as an expression to heal the world. Your first film, Crave. Um, Got a lot of attention. Surprisingly so. We, we made this documentary and um, I built it on the book Soul Cravings that, that really asked the question, what are the unifying features of human beings? What makes us human? And, and over about 20 years of research, I came to this conclusion. There are three intrinsic cravings or um, uh, motivations that explain every human action. It's the human need for intimacy, the human need for meaning, and the human need for progress, or a nicer word is destiny. Mm -hmm. and, and so I took these basic intrinsic cravings, and, and as I studied them, I felt like these were God's way of designing us so that we would be driven to search for him. You say there's no ordinary child ever been born. Well, that's right. We're all How encouraging. Born. Yeah, no, I, I, and I believe that, you know. But unfortunately, most of us die ordinary, somewhere between birth and death. Uh, things go bad. So Crave was uh, an eight-day experiment in Vancouver. It's a Canadian film. 
And, uh, and I said, find me the most irreligious, God-hating, you know, cynical, skeptical people you can find, and let me interview them, and, and let me take them through the process of soul cravings and talk about these human intrinsics, and, and let me show you that these people that you think are closer to gospel are actually really open. And so we did this, uh, you know, just blitz of interviews, and we even walked into apocotherapy bars and interviewed people on the spot and cafes and just found people who would be interviewed. And, and if they were a Christian, we really wouldn't interview them. If they were open to faith, we wouldn't interview them. But if they were antagonistic or atheists <laughs> or, um, or connected somehow to uh, some kind of subculture, then we would interview them. And every single time, we had a positive response, even to people being tearful about their openness to um, to God and their need for Christ. And so this uh, documentary uh, takes the slices of those conversations and, and really in some ways guides us through a process of how to use soul cravings in our conversations with an unbelieving and even cynical world.